very important for you to think, particularly for your country, these walls, these obstacles, like Dorothy said, that prevent you from reducing, let's say, the risk that relates to this air pollution exposures in your country. Like the example we did yesterday, we want to go from 15 micrograms of cubic meter of PM 2.5 to 10, which is like the WHO uh, safe limit for PM 2.5. So you scientists, you generate data or not, or partial data. So how can you actually convince politicians and stakeholders to reduce these exposures in order to provide better air and therefore better health to your fellow citizens in your own country? So what stops you from delivering that? What stops you from preventing you, as scientists, to convey the important scientific evidence to policymakers? So this is what you have, you have to think about. So with no further ado, let me uh, welcome to the podium Dr. Olivier Sanel, who will do some uh, very important case studies and examples that relate to calculating uh, social costs for various health outcomes due to exposures to air pollution. Yeah. Olivier. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have two hours, even if you are a little bit late, it's okay, for the lunch. Uh, One hour, 55 minutes. 55 minutes, okay. So uh, first, I, I, I've put on the slides more certainly than I will be able to present, but as you can download the, the slides, if you're interested in a specific point uh, I did not have time to develop, you will by yourself uh, have a look to, to it. Then my presentation will be in three parts. The first one uh, consists in a, a case study related to health uh, uh, effects and the monetization of health effects of uh, air pollution, related more or less with uh, the yesterday's uh, presentations all, all along the day uh, on the health effect of uh, air pollution. And then I'm going to move to the second part, which uh, will be on the economic assessment of climate change, so a more broad perspective with uh, different uh, issues uh, at stake. And finally, a second case study uh, related on the impact of climate change on um, uh, Camargue, which is a part in the south of France uh, where uh, we have a lot of uh, problem with the flood and, and the, the effects of climate change are very, very uh, pregnant, uh, even currently. Uh, so, and last point, um, because it is difficult to organize a, a case study uh, with you working on a computer on the economic topic because uh, none of you are economists. However, uh, what I've tried to do is to uh, ask you questions during my presentation. I will stop, ask a question, you will uh, think by yourself and, and give the answer, I, I note them, and then I present the, the answers uh, and I will do that five times during the, the presentation. So the first case today is going to be on uh, the hidden uh, economic burden of air pollution related morbidity. It's uh, in fact a, a work we have done with uh, three epidemiologist colleagues, uh, Laura Perez, Nicole, Nino Kinsley uh, from uh, University of Basel in Switzerland, and Sylvia Medina from Santé Publique France in France, and uh, myself. Uh, it has been published in December 2016 in the European Journal of Health Economics. And our motivations were uh, the fact that we observe and we know, and you, you know now, after all the presentation during these uh, first days of the, this workshop, that uh, the short-term effects are, of air pollution have less impact in terms of uh, effects and economic effects than the long-term effects. But at, at the same time, it's more difficult to get uh, data from chronic disease uh, also although these uh, chronic diseases are the, the likely contributors to the long-term mortality and the burden of the mortality in general. So uh, up to now, uh, it's very rare that the chronic morbidity uh, has been uh, assessed in uh, economic studies, except chronic bronchitis, which is a little bit uh, well known. Uh, and for the five or 10 years, 
some studies have been published showing that air pollution can contribute to the onset or the development of chronic pathologies. That is, someone uh, is going to be asthmatic or is going to, to have a, a, a cardiovascular disease uh, because of the exposition during the early stage of life for asthma or during the long uh, life uh, exposure. And this is going to really onset this disease. So the perspective is a little bit different from when we study acute effects for which we have only exacerbation of uh, a disease. Here, the wool disease is associated to the exposure uh, or to air pollution. So there is evidence of earth effects due to living in proximity to busy road uh, that is growing. And we can uh, accept that the near road traffic related pollution may capture something different from the background pollution. What the network uh, measure as background uh, PM or urban PM, or depends uh, where the, the, the captors are, 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 are sit, uh, located. It is one piece of information, but the other one is the fact that you live close to a very busy road. So we can see here how the pollution uh, NO2, PM2.5, and uh, ultrafine particulate matter here decrease when you move away from uh, a busy road. When you are one kilometer away from a busy road, here you have about 10% of the ultrafine particulate matter. And when you are very close to, to it, you have, uh, you have 100%. And it depends also of the wind. If you are south wind or uh, if you have, uh, yes, south wind or upwind, there is a little difference. But we can see this pattern of decrease for these three pollutants, for instance, uh, depending on where you are from a, a busy road. Second uh, piece of information, we have s publications that show that uh, traffic-related air pollution uh, have uh, health uh, effects. So regularly there are publications on this topic. And we have also studies that show, for instance, for asthma risk in children, you can see that uh, depending on your distance from a busy road, the relative risk of uh, having asthma in children decrease with a significant relative risk when you are uh, between zero and 100 meter, meters from the, the busy road, and then uh, non-significantly different from one, so that is no excess risk when, when you are farther than uh, 100 meters. So the objectives of this case study uh, were twofold. First, a methodological uh, contribution. Uh, and pro this is what I'm going to present now, a step-by-step -step economic assessment of air pollution-related mor morbidity. And also, once this is going to be done, uh, an application uh, to estimate the health impacts and the economic impacts of air pollution with the, st the standard measure and the one we propose, the comprehensive health impact assessment for 10 European cities of the, the AFICOM project. Once again, it, it is uh, focused on, uh, on Europe because uh, it's easier for us to get the data and, and, and there are more data in European countries than elsewhere, so here uh, it's in Europe. But the, the methodology is valid, uh, obviously, for, for every country. So the outline of my talk is going to present the methodology first, then the application and some concluding remarks. So the, the methodology. What we propose is what we refer to as a comprehensive air pollution health impact assessment. We start from the idea that the population is exposed to different uh, factors that affect health. Some of them are related to exposure to air pollution, long-term exposure to air pollution, and there are other factors. Then this population is going to develop chronic disease that are onset by uh, near road traffic pollution, asthma or, um, or the, the cardiovascular disease, or that are not at all due to near road traffic pollution. So block A and block B. Then what we are doing when we, we compute and we do a standard uh, health impact assessment is to compute the exacerbations that are due to background pollution, not accounting for the fact that they, they occurred in a population that 
develop uh, this chronic disease uh, due to exposure to traffic road pollution or not. So we compute the blue part, A prime and B prime, and this is what we, we do with the time series analysis, for instance. But what, what we, we are saying is two things. First, if we can link exposure to near road traffic pollution to the onset of chronic disease, we have also to take into account the whole cost of this chronic disease over the life, because without this near road traffic pollution, there would be no chronic disease, so no exacerbation, whatever the cause. And second, the idea that even if the exacerbation of this chronic disease is not due to background pollution, if it, occur, if it occurs in a population that developed chronic disease due to the exposure or near road traffic pollution, we must also take into account this exacerbation that are not due to uh, background pollution. Because if you are asthmatic due to uh, the fact that uh, when you, you were a child, you lived close to a, a very polluted uh, street, then all the exacerbation of the asthma attack you will have during the, the, your whole life will disappear if you were not asthmatic. You see the, the, the point? And so what we are going to do is not only to assess the blue block, but also the red, blue, and uh, green blocks. And this is a comprehensive health impact assessment. The prevalence of the chronic disease plus the exacerbation in blue and the part in green of the exacerbation uh, occurring uh, not due to background pollution, okay? So uh, I'm going to move to the way we proceed. And this is the first question. According to your, your own background and your knowledge and, and what you, you think, which type of data do we need to develop a metric of traffic exposure? I know you have some, uh, some uh, lectures uh, the day before, uh, the days before even. So according to, to you, what, if you have to do such a job, what would be the type of data you should uh, look for to, to be able to, to do this computation? So the first step of the, of the analysis. You can uh, use a microphone. Thanks. Uh, or, or how would you? I think that we need uh, uh, a number of vehicles. Yes. Exposed. The number of population exposed near to the traffic. The, the size of the population exposed, that is okay. The maybe meteorological condition. Mm -hmm. That's all, I think. Okay, other, yes. You should have the distance as you show from the roads, for the main roads, and uh, uh, you should have uh, data or modelization of the concentration of particles from the road moving, I mean, to have the exposure level. Uh, then the metric of the exposure level, I think it's a matter of debate, if mass or number of particles, but this is, a, I don't know if you consider this in your study. Okay. It will also be interesting to look at maybe some hot spots like traffic lights. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe also the list of the different uh, pollutants uh, emitted by tra traffic uh, activity. Okay. And the concentration. Uh, I think the first thing is the, how much the amount of the emission come out from the vehicles. Very system. I also think uh, the type of vehicles will be the type of vehicles lorries or, or, okay. or buses or okay. Okay, so we have more or less. 
um, the topography of the place in case okay. there is a mountain mm -hmm. that is blocking or something. Okay. And the type of pollutants emitted, like if it is PM or NO2 or uh, something else. A quick one. Maybe the type of fuel that the vehicles run on, either it's diesel or petrol or gas. I think uh, mass concentration and must be in the number concentration for the ultra fine particulate matter because ultra fine particulate matter causes more health, more uh, adverse health effects and even can cancer causing. So, if you understand the number concentration and mass concentration, we can decide the metric for the traffic exposure, and by that way you can uh, you can measure the risk assessment or a particular chemical species. Without that, you cannot uh, say this is the uh, high or low air uh, pollution is going on here. I think so. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> we, we should, I think we should also know the, the type of, the type and the, the kind of people living around the street. Yes, it has been said somewhere uh, in, in a different uh, way, but okay. And the last point, uh, just behind you. And I think uh, wind speed and wind direction can be also uh? a good point. Wind speed and wind direction. Wind, wind speed and wind direction, it has been said also. Okay, w in fact, an answer. But just <laughs> the mic, I don't have the question. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, someone say there are some passive and active devices to measure the pollutant concentration, and to say we can check uh, our early traffic pattern, uh, climate, sun exposure, wind speed, season. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, what you propose, you, you had the, uh, the, the answers uh, that are here. What you proposed would be in an ideal world, because knowing for a given city, over a year or several years, the wind speed, the type of traffic, uh, the, the type of vehicles, the, the meteorological conditions uh, would be nice, but uh, it's too much work. So what has been done is to use population distribution by age and census or building, you mentioned it, land use map, and traffic flow maps or road classification maps because there are two ways to, to take into account the link between the proximity to uh, a road. So to use analysis that have already assessed the relative risk with respect to the distance to the busy roads. And it is a, it's a difficult task, but it is an easier way to proceed. And the second, thing, second way to proceed is what emerged from your answer, that is to enter in more detail in what circulate, which type of vehicles circulate on the roads, uh, which are the configuration of the roads, the traffic lights, and so on. But it would be a too difficult and too long task to do, to do this. So how we proceed is that we, we use a geographical information system to compute the distance of each grid point of the city with an associated population, I will show you uh, in the next slide, with the nearest road classified as major road, that is a road on which more than 10,000 vehicles per day are uh, uh, driving on this road. And so we start from a map here of each of the 10 cities. We remove all the, all the public uh, buildings and we keep only the, the buildings where people live and we spread the population of each of these census. The census tract was as precise as possible depending on the cities, and we spread all this population in each of the buildings so that after that we compute the distance here of each of these block of people spread in, depending on the size of the building to the distance, the busy road, the, the more close to this part of the building. It was a, a zoom of this part. And then we get for each of the city a distribution of the population depending on the proximity to the uh, closest major, major road. So this was for the epidemiologic part. For the uh, economic assessment, what we need with respect to the standard health impact assessment 
is to value the box A, that is the prevalence or the onset of chronic disease. So we have to get a measure of the whole cost of asthma uh, or uh, um, the, the, uh, the cardiovascular disease we, we have chosen. And then we have also to take into account the fact that we cannot count the full exacerbation cost for the patient who developed this exacerbation and the chronic disease onset due to exposure to air pollution because the full cost of prevalence already include a small part or a, part, a share of the exacerbation cost. If you count how much uh, costs uh, asthma per year, being asthmatic per year, there is a part which is due to uh, the, the treatment. There is a part that, which is due to the fact that you lost quality of life, but there is a, a part that is due to the exacerbation of, of asthma that makes you go to hospital. So this is exacerbation cost. This part is already included in the prevalence cost. So we have to compute a partial exacerbation cost for those cases of exacerbation that occur in the population that developed the chronic disease due to exposure to near road traffic pollution. Maybe it's going to be clearer with the application. So we need, for the standard approach, the health impact assessment, standard health impact assessment approach, we only need the full exacerbation cost, and we apply it to the number of exacerbation depending on whether or not it is due to near road traffic pollution. For the comprehensive uh, health impact assessment method, we need also this full exacerbation cost, but we need, in addition, a partial exacerbation cost to be applied to the exacerbation that occur in the chronic disease that occur uh, in the population uh, yeah, that are due to near road traffic pollution. And in addition, we need the cost of chronic disease onset due to near road traffic pollution, the red, the red square. So now, uh, regarding the application, and I, I will go step by step so that it's going to be maybe clear. It has been done within the AFECOM project uh, during uh, three years. Uh, there were 60 scientists that work in uh, 25 cities in 12 countries of Europe. Uh, these were the uh, 25 cities in, uh, with a blue square. Uh, you can see that there are a few in Spain, in France, in Italy, in Slovenia, in Romania, at Athens, Budapest, Vienna, Stockholm, uh, Brussels, Liverpool here, and also Dublin. Uh, but this work has been done for only 10 cities, the 10 cities with the blue square, because it's a very huge task to proceed to the computation I, 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 sh I showed before, that is to go to the map of the city, remove the public building, and so on and so on. So it has been done for the, the 10 cities here. So second question, now to, to implement the, this application, which type of data do we need in addition to the one we need to measure the proximity to, to the busy road of the population? Uh, so some are obvious. So to really uh, compute this, uh, this cost, uh, Imagine that we already have the computation of the number of people, uh, number of persons exposed to. Uh, we have what we get is a distribution of people depending on the proximity to uh, a major B zero. Now we need some different components to to be able to compute the cost, starting from the epidemiology. Yes? Um, uh, probably the cost of the healthcare in the, each of these cities and the accessibility and so on, and how much it is developed and so on. The cost of, mm -hmm. for each city, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's almost the same. I wanted to say uh, the hospital admission and uh, the medicine prescription by a medical doctor. The number of time, I mean, those who are around uh, that uh, road, I mean, they go to the hospital mm -hmm. for, I mean, respiratory or cardiovascular disease. 
also we need uh, also we need to know which diseases are related to air pollution and uh, what is the how to say the percentage or the contribution of air pollution in burden of these diseases so to be able to calculate um, from this the the cost uh, the yeah the cost and uh, uh, saved lives also the share of this yeah my point was similar here it's if you have specific relative risk for each city or if you have to use who uh, mean relative risk or something else for Europe. Okay, so we need another suggestion here. Uh, for epidemiological study, I think uh, first uh, we need some parameters uh, you can derive from the USCPA or WHO. Just, just, uh, just like for, uh, if you need to calculate the risk for adult and children per child, first you should note the some specific parameter like uh, body weight of adult and children, and in, uh, and air inhalation rate. If you are focusing on the inhalation rate, how much you are inhaling the air from outside inside our body, mm. so inhalation rate is very important. In, uh, of course, in uh, cubic meter per day, or body weight in kg, and similarly, you should know the, what is the, for example, suppose you are going to calculate the cancer. So for that, you should know, at least you should derive from some specific uh, sources, the cancer slow factor of a particular chemical species which are already present onto the particulate matter or even ultrafine particulate matter. So if you're going to study for the epidemiological point of views or uh, risk analysis, we should have, we should must have the parameters for adult and, uh, and children. It is good for the specific, for any cities, for epidemiological study. I think so. Okay. That would be an ideal survey we, you are proposing because. Uh, I think uh, number of mortality <coughs> in these cities uh, information of air pollutants and the number of people exposure for pollutants and uh, we need to update the index of limitation of the pollutants in these 10 cities. Okay, uh, for the morbidity part is okay. The first one, mortality, we are dealing with the morbidity here, so, but the, the other one, uh, okay. So we have more or less all the information that is the population, the, a measure of the concentration of the background level of air pollution. We already have the, the exposure of the population to the, due to the proximity to, to near road. We have to choose the relative risk, uh, as you said. We, we cannot proceed and go in detail to the hospital and the number of cases observed in hospital. It, it's a wool work by itself doing that. It would be better, but it's a wool work. Uh, how we proceed is to work statistically and apply relative risk of developing this uh, uh, chronic disease and also relative risk associated to the proximity of living to this, uh, living close to this um, uh, busy road. So here are what we get. Uh, first, I explained the two scenarios. It's a global burden approach. We study the two steady states, the move from no, uh, the current situation in each of the 10 cities to the situation in which nobody lives near to major city, so nobody developed chronic disease due to living close to major roads, and the background uh, pollution is the one uh, associated to the air quality uh, guideline from WHO for uh, PM10 and NO2, that is uh, respect the annual mean of 20 micrograms per cubic meter. So this is the background pollution is used to compute the exacerbation case, and the uh, proximity to road exposure is used to compute the share of the onset of disease due to this exposure. So we have the 10 cities here, the population, as you said, the background uh, annual uh, pollution in the second and third uh, uh, columns, and then the fraction of the population which is exposed to, uh, 
traffic pollution within uh, 75, uh, 100, and 150 meters, depending on the cities. You can, see, uh, you can see that there are major differences. So we have to choose two uh, chronic outcomes. It's going to be asthma prevalence for children and coronary heart disease for uh, people over 65, because these were, at the time of the study, the two chronic disease for which we can get the, the more the scientific literature what the, the more robust in associating these uh, two chronic disease on set with the exposure to near road traffic pollution. We choose two acute outcome, that is the exacerbation, that, and it's easy for asthma, it is the hospitalization for asthma uh, for children uh, between 0 and 17 observed in each of the 10 cities, and the same thing for acute myocardial infarction, which is an exacerbation of a coronary heart disease. And then you have here in the table the relative risk or the, uh, for, or related to the health outcomes for the prevalence and for the exacerbation. And you apply this. We, we are going to apply this to the population to get the number of cases associated. And then this number of cases are going to be valued through the economy, economic part. For this part, we, we also uh, did a literature review looking for the morbidity cost related to asthma. So you have several studies, and you have the, the fat uh, black line here, which represent, oops. <laughs> which represents here the, uh, the average, the mean here, you have the, the distribution of the values of in the literature. We did that for asthma and for the coronary heart disease. So that finally we get the economic value. And this is what we need to compute the co average cost per exacerbation by the cost of illness approach. For each of the countries uh, involved, we have the average length of stay at hospital for uh, an hospitalization for asthma or for acute myocardial infection. We have the average cost per day at this hospital, the average work loss due to uh, this uh, two uh, chronic disease. They are quite low because the, the population is over 65 or below 17. So they are not a large share of the population who is working at, at these ages, about 8%. Uh, so this, this is why the average cost is, is low. Uh, then you compute the direct average hospital cost by multiplying the length of the stay at hospital times the cost per day for each of the uh, country and for the two CD on set here. Here you did the, we did the same thing for the average cost of work lost and finally we get here in the last column the average hospital cost. So this is a summary of the unit economic values we have uh, chosen here. And the way we account for the fact that a share, 50% of the average cost of asthma is due to hospitalization. And 21 times, about 21% of the annual cost of having uh, health disease is due to hospital costs. So we remove this from the full exacerbation cost to account for the fact that these costs are already taken into account in the annual average prevalence cost of asthma and coronary heart disease. And we get this result. I'm, but I, uh, it's not readable, but I sum up this result. I just explained. You have here all the boxes, the white, the blue, green, and red boxes, the number of cases, the economic value for the standard health impact assessment and for the comprehensive health impact assessment. And I present to you a summary of the results. When we compute on these 10 cities, in these 10 cities, the standard approach, we obtain an average cost of half a million euro. When we take into account the exacerbation costs that are not due to air pollution, that is the green block, we obtain an additional 8.3 million euro. When we compute the prevalence cost, you see that the prevalence cost is going to be the, the larger part of, of, of the cost because it's going to last for a, a long time and 
it's uh, also uh, more important in terms of uh, cost. So we add uh, 362 additional million so that the approach we apply to these 10 cities get as a result that the comprehensive uh, valuation is about 370 million to be compared to the half million obtained with the standard approach. So as a conclusion, we can say that uh, first, from an epidemiologic perspective, the pollutants along busy roads could be responsible for large but preventable burden of chronic disease. We found considerable larger burden of air pollution than with the standard uh, health impact assessment. And the best preventive action is to avoid the exacerbation by avoiding the disease altogether. If you remove the fact that, uh, that people are going to develop asthma due to uh, exposure in uh, infant when they were young to, to air pollution, you remove the whole life uh, cost of asthma for these people. And this approach can be uh, applied to other diseases associated to air pollution, like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary urinary disease or lung cancer, for instance, or even other, other uh, type of uh, benefits when the, uh, this is the same substance that causes the chronic disease and causes the exacerbation. As soon as it is the case uh, in agriculture, energy, health, transport, waste, water, and so on, if the same substance causes the chronic disease and the exacerbation, then you can apply this approach. Okay, this is over for this part. We can switch to the other uh, the staff, technical staff, please. Alessandro, we have to switch. I have a question, Olivier. Yes. Um, how do you deal with the population data? Do you have the distribution by age? We have the distribution by age, yes. Uh, I think I show it quickly, or maybe not. No, I think there is only... Uh, I don't remember if I... Uh, we have by age, below 17, above 65, yes. And the whole population, yes. Any other question when we switch, shift to the other presentation? No? Okay. Okay. Then let's move to the second part, which is the economic assessment of climate change. I slightly changed the title because economic cost was too broad, and here uh, I focus on the, the climate change. If I have to sum up the big challenge uh, we face as, as human beings or economists face, uh, when trying to, to, to tackle climate change, it would be determine how much society is willing to give up today to reduce the consequences of climate change tomorrow. It could be through mitigation policies to reduce the emission of uh, greenhouse gases, or adaptation policies, because we know that there will be uh, an increase in temperature, uh, and these adaptation policies allow us to reduce the consequences of climate change. And the major differences uh, between uh, this uh, challenge and what we have to, to tackle with local air pollutants are uh, not on the impact on health, which are almost similar, but in deal with the impacts other than health, with non-market dimension, there are more uncertainty because we also work with a more distant hori time horizon. So with local air pollutants, most of the effects are either short term, a few days, or uh, long term, that is uh, 30, 40, 40 years. With climate change, we are speaking of century or millennia, uh, if we are ambitious. And uh, for the economist, the uncertainty is very huge, and the impact of discounting is going to be uh, one of the major uh, uh, trap we have to, to avoid. So the sketch of my presentation will be to have an overview of the impacts involved, then to focus on market and non-market values, to focus on uh, the economy, uh, just give a, a few results regarding the economic assessment of the costs and benefits of climate change, focus on the influence of time because there are three components uh, of time that are going to be involved in the variation of the economic impacts of climate change. And finally, have the second case study on the climate change in Camargue. So 
I think you have similar things, but uh, because I add the, the economic component, I, I will sketch the, the picture with you. We have air pollution that is going to first uh, induce uh, climate change with effects on uh, oceans, acidification, reduction of marine resources, with, which means loss in yields for, for the marine resources. On the other side, on the earth, we have on the ground, we have uh, sea level rise, extreme rainfalls and extreme temperature, which uh, induce uh, floods, uh, drought, forest fires, uh, heat waves, and these two have effects on buildings. The violet blocks are the blocks we are interested in as economists for which we are looking for prices or value. We have to value these impacts. This is all the violet blocks that should be valued. The, these two uh, blocks, uh, orange blocks, are going to also have impact on the loss of biodiversity, the deterioration of ecosystems, and increase in pests of various types. And these blocks is going to also decrease the yields in food and in forest resources. The food, the flood, this block is going to have health impacts directly. Physical or, or mental health are going to be involved. Because if you die in a forest fire or due to a heat wave or uh, because you are flood, uh, so you, or if you are ill or, or injured due to this uh, type of impacts, then you, you have uh, health effects. Here, you will have effects regarding malnutrition or infectious disease. These, I, I, I labeled that uh, indirect health effects. And we also have this loss in the yields induce uh, less food. The forest fires, flood, and so on induce that the land where you live are no more uh, possible to live in, so that you will have climate refugees, conflicts for the resources, which mean that we have what I, I labeled rela related health effects due to the population displacement and the disease importation from one area to the other because population are trying to survive and go to, to other places. This is for climate change. But air pollution has also effect locally, which imply damages to building too. You have to, 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 to clean the buildings uh, regularly. There are also direct health effects. We, we have studied them uh, yesterday. Uh, we have also a loss of biodiversity, deterioration of ecosystems, increase in pests. So that the whole picture is this one. And we have also, as uh, Augustin uh, told us this morning, effects in the both directions between climate change and local air poll pollution. So that we have in common, most of the uh, violet blocks should be valued and are common with climate change and uh, local air pollution. These are these blocks we should value. As I said yesterday, and as we will see in a minute, the economic approach is anthropocentric. That is something as a value because we need it in a way. It affects our well-being directly. It, it may be the fact that I know that this type of birds is preserved in Amazonia as a value for me. It may be not a direct use, but it has a value because you think, as human, you are on Earth, and you think it has a value because if there were uh, no human beings on Earth, we would not be uh, trying to assess the impacts of climate change. There will be less climate change, by the way. So this change in well-being has indirect effect on the environment uh, variables and also uh, direct health effects. And so we can allocate these uh, different blocks to these two uh, type of effects. We have here the uh, indirect effects on the environment and the health effects that can be uh, considered with the three uh, distinctions I've made, but also they cover, in fact, direct cost hospitalization, that is morbidity and mortality, and indirect cost. And uh, here we can see that clearly that all the parts dealing with loss of biodiversity, deterioration of ecosystems, and increase in pests are related to non-market variation. There are no direct market that allow us to have a price for this. 
For the damages to buildings and the loss of yields, uh, forest resources or food, you have uh, market, uh, market for clean up, cleaning up buildings, uh, the, the food market, uh, with the price for wet, rice, uh, wine, whatever you want, timber as a, as, a mark, uh, as a market too, so you can observe price on the market. For the health effect, we have seen yesterday that uh, if I, I, I do this uh, little uh, reallocation, we have the market values, mostly the morbidity effects and the loss of production. You have a wage market, a job market, and you have uh, tariffs uh, for hospital cost. And you have also the not market dimension, that is the main one being the value of a premature death and the psychological impact of living in a polluted place or, or of being flooded. If you survive to a flood, the fact that you have been flooded and you, you may have uh, feel fear and it may affect you, you may be in post-traumatic uh, stress. So there are also uh, psychological eff effects. So what the economist is looking for dealing with climate change or uh, local air pollutant is to try a way to value all this dimension. And the additional uh, thing to be taken into account in the climate change uh, approach is that we are dealing with very distant horizon. So now if we consider market and non-market values, uh, I will present what we mean by value as an economist. So as I said, it is anthropocentric. It expresses the degree to which a good or service satisfies individual preferences. And it is based on the fact that you are willing to trade off something against a good. It may be money, and you prefer spending money for a specific good than another, though it is a trade-off between these two use of money that explain that you attribute a value to something. Or it may be time. If you sacrifice some time to get something, it is because this thing has a value for you. But there are, for ecosystem, biodiversity, or, or things like that, of, of the value of life, we have no markets. So we have the two approach we have uh, uh, seen yesterday, the revealed preference and the stated preference approaches that can be used. And uh, before presenting them and uh, asking you another question, I will decompose, I will split the, the economic value in different components. Uh, what has a value for you? Is it has a value. Why something has a value for you? It has a value because you can use it. You can use it by con with consumption. It is uh, fisheries, timber, agriculture, or without consumption. If you work in a forest, or if you have some educational activities related to nature, for instance, you do not consume per se uh, this good, but you have a direct use of this good. You have also an indirect use value that is provided by the ecosystem, the carbon sequestration services, the, some coastal ecosystems also provide uh, ecosystem services, also self-purifying properties of a wetland, for instance. There are also potential use value that are unrelated to a current or future use. That is an option value that is in the future. I may have some personal direct or indirect use of a good, but I do not know currently which it it's going to be. And you have, among the potential use values, the informational value, which is related to the fact that when you decide something, what to do to improve the, the future situation, you take decision. If this decision is irreversible, the economists are giving a value to the fact that you delay an irreversible decision waiting for future information. That is, we, sometimes we, uh, we do not know currently the scientific uh, uh, are not enough uh, reliable in the, in the conclusion, so we are going to wait a few years before deciding. But the fact that you wait for a few years has an economic value, which is called the informa informational value. You wait until you, es you estimate you get enough information to take a decision. But the fact that you, you miss some possibility of action during the time you wait has an economic value. And finally, we have the non-use value or passive value among which the existence value, the simple fact that you know that a certain good and service exists somewhere, like the bird in Amazonia, has a value for you. Even if nobody uses it or nobody enjoys it, you, and nobody sees this, this bird in Amazonia, it may have a value. The bequest value corresponds to the fact that you may preserve some goods for the future generations, and the altruistic value, the fact that currently, today, you do not use a uh, good, but you know that 
someone else can use it today, benefit from the good of the service, and it has a value for you. All these aspects constitute the total economic value, that is, all what is embedded in the concept of economic value, the use value, the non-use value. And we, you can see here that the market component is only a small share of the, all the value you can get. That is here, a share of the direct interaction Zeus with consumption correspond to uh, market component, but all the other are non-market component. You have no value for altruism, no value for existence value, for because value, and so on. You, can, you must find other ways than the market to get an assessment of the value for these components. I'm going to skip uh, the reason why it is important to value. Um, yeah, yes, maybe uh, just study why we should account for the total economic value, because cost-benefit analysis imply both market and non-market components. And the, the, the standard procedure to estimate a cost-benefit analysis is to compute the benefits, to compute the cost, maybe start by the cost and the benefits, and finally compare the cost and benefits. For the benefits, you should uh, identify all the things that are damaged, plants, animals, human health, aesthetics. Once you have done that, you determine, determine, you estimate, you choose a relationship between every possible action and every damage level. That is, you use a relative risk for us, for instance. Then you place monetary value on each of the damage. Then you sum it and you get the benefits. For the cost, you have to assess the cost of an action or cost of a policy. Once you have done that, you should compare the costs and benefits by aggregating them at every date in the future, and then discount the future costs and benefits, that is, put in current value, today's value, the flow of costs and benefits in the future, that is using what is called a discount rate, a kind of inflation rate, I will detail that later on, and finally, a confirmed uncertainty. This is the whole picture of what we should do in a cost-benefit analysis, and what is going to be done here is to check how to get a variation of the damage and then how to account for discounting the future and the uncertainties. So as I said, there are three ways. The market price approach, we have seen that yesterday. But as I, uh, I said for, okay, already said that, okay. This is our market work. At equilibrium, you have a quantity and a price on the market and then you can get uh, a price uh, to be applied to the market share of uh, market component of a good or service. But you can also use this market approach to value some environmental goods or services from the market costs that would be necessary should these goods or services disappear. I, I give a, a, an example here and you will have to think about it. It is a question. The question is how can you use the direct market approach to value the, disp the loss of a wetland. That is, you have to, to, the question has two components. First, what is the value of a wetland? And if the wetland disappears, what would be the loss for human beings? And then how to value this loss? Difficult question. <laughs> So you, you came from different backgrounds, so some are more uh, familiar with uh, the wet, what are the services provided by wetlands. Uh, so what is a wetland useful for, from a general perspective? Yes? Uh, thank you. It's a huge question. Uh, Basically, wetland means a lot to us. Uh, we can say ec uh, ecologically, it's the, it is the kidney. We say it's an ecological kidney. It filters uh, surface impurities and gives us uh, clean underground water. Uh, you know, the drinking water, we get it from underground. Ecological... Uh, uh, fit? Yeah. Could, that's it. There is a noise from the... Ecological food? Uh, uh, benefit. Benefits, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, okay, yes, that's and, it. Uh, secondly, uh, we use the wetlands uh, in various manners. For example, we uh, cultivate fish, so it gives a huge value for us. We have a food, uh, okay. money as well. And secondly, uh, in India, uh, water is very important for every religion, every culture. 
So we take what bath, we use the water for uh, many uh, religious activities. So the societal value is also very important in that case. So disappearing wetlands means a lot because it also supports a biodiversity, huge biodiversity, food, I mean, uh, birds, fishes, amphibians, and uh, many more. So it's a lo huge loss. Uh, wetland loss means a huge loss to economy, ecology, and society as well. Thank okay. you so much. So uh, we, you said recreational activities, more or less, religious and so on, okay. And ecological benefits. That, this is two of the components. There are at least two others that have uh, value for human beings, or people living uh, close to these wetland areas. Yes? I think that uh, losing wetlands may cause uh, many damage to economic because of uh, cultivation. We lose cultivation around the, these wetlands and this can be economically um, a big damage uh, for the surrounding people, the people who live there. Uh, moreover, the ecosystem that you told. Ecosystem, yes. yes. Uh, the first one is you lose? Cultivation, I mean farming. Farming, okay, okay, agriculture, it, it was already mentioned. Okay, there are two, odd, yes? Maybe uh, there will be uh, some people who lost his uh, works in agriculture. Maybe it, uh, sh they should be immigrate. So maybe the immigration of the people okay. who live there. Uh, a related effect, okay. So the, the two other were uh, se the self purifying property. Ah, okay. uh, we have another, another utility for wetlands. Uh, in Kolkata, we have a uh, big wetlands uh, and it is Ramsar site. So the entire city liquid sewage comes to that uh, wetlands and on the other end of the wetlands we get a very fresh and pure water, very clean okay. water because that is cleans the impurities. Exactly, so, it is self purifying properties. Uh, this one and the other one what a decrease in food in flood probability. So this, these are the four main uh, things we can associated to, to uh, wetland. And then, how could you value these four components? So the increase in, in so the decrease in flood, uh, the, so the dispersion of uh, wetland is going to increase the flood probability, to decrease recreational uh, use, to decrease biodiversity, and to decrease self-purifying properties. So, well, these are the, the four main components, and how can we use direct method of valuation through markets, through prices, to assess what is the impact of this uh, degradation or loss of wetland, which is more or less non-market. Uh, there are no market for wetland, but there are these four components that may be valued through uh, the market uh, price approach. So, because it is economic, <laughs> you, you are less, less. Uh, so I, I will uh, uh, summarize here. So, as we said, there is an increase in flood risks, and this can be uh, valued by estimating what would be the health cost in case of flood, and what would be the cost of the damages to building, agriculture, and commercial activities in case of flood. Then, for the decrease in recreational use, fishing and leisure, uh, religious activities, there is uh, a cost in the local ac economic activity, restaurant, uh, hostel, people uh, visiting uh, Iran, so there is a loss and direct loss due to the, the loss of fishes. For the decrease in biodiversity, it's going to need the reintroduction of extirpated, sp extirpated species to regain the quality of the damaged ecosystem, and so there is a cost of reintroduction of these species. You pay people to, to put uh, these species back to their uh, uh, environment, initial environment. And finally, for the decrease in the self-purifying properties of the wetland, you can uh, compute what would be the cost of a new or a larger water treatment plant to replace the work that was done by the by the wetland. So you can see that even for something which has no price per se, uh, the uh, wetland, you can find ways to 
uh, estimate the value of this wetland by uh, using the, the market approach. But these four uh, components uh, do not deal with uh, the uh, non-use uh, dimension because if you benefit from uh, an improvement uh, in the uh, in a decrease in the risk of flood or of <coughs> the local activities or the damage to building in case of flood or the introduction of species, it's direct use. People are going to benefit directly from this. It's not in the future, it's not uh, altruistic, it's not bequest value, it's not existence value, so it's use value. And market can only value uh, direct uh, use value, not non-use value. So to be able to estimate the non-use components, we have to use the uh, direct approach, which is a stated preferences, to ask people how much are you willing to pay to preserve this wetland. By saying that, they will not only consider the dire direct benefits they can get, the four we have mentioned earlier, but also the fact that they can preserve this wetland for their children, for other people. I'm willing to pay something f for people living in another place of the country or, or in the world uh, to uh, preserve that this wetland, and this cannot be assessed by a, the direct market approach. So if you want to add to the direct use values we have assessed for the three components we have uh, identified for a wetland, we should also use stated preferences to estimate the non-use value. So in conclusion, uh, the economic assessment of climate change will require the consideration of uh, many impacts specific to different sectors of the economy. Some have a market price, some do not have a market price, and even those that have a market price, we can also only capture for this uh, component the use value. And this assessment will only be a prerequisite and will need to incorporate the temporal dimension, we will see that in a minute, the link with other environmental effects and be compared to the cost of mitigation and adaptation policies. So then I have something related to the economic assessment of climate change, uh, but I, I, I will be very quick in presenting. Uh, in fact, there are two uh, ways. Uh, we must um, split in two categories the economic violation. The first one, evaluate the effects of climate change by calculating the expected damages for two scenarios that differ in magnitude or consequences. For instance, the reference scenario, business as usual, if we do nothing, we will have these consequences. Alternative scenario, if we succeed in uh, reducing the increase in the temperature to two degrees, then we will have also damages, but less damages. And it is a difference between these two damages that constitute the benefits from a policy uh, of mitigation of climate change. It is a difference between two costs that is going to be the benefits of a policy. And on the other side, we have the cost of the policies, that is how much we have to pay, how much we have to change our behavior and what are the consequences, economic consequences of changing our behavior today to observe this reduction in the increase of temperature or the reduction in the damages uh, due to climate change. So we have the benefits part, difference between two uh, uh, scenarios, and the cost of the policies by themselves. So uh, if we consider the economic assessment of the damages avoided, that, that is the benefits, according to OECD, um, although some effects may be positive, for instance, tourism, so some places in, in the world are going to have more to tourists, the gross national product of all countries except Canada and Russia will be negatively affected by climate change because Canada and Russia will have gain in terms of agriculture. And partly in Nepal, it has been mentioned this morning because of the culture that is in the north, northern uh, India, uh, there will be also small uh, benefits, but uh, they are cancelled by all the costs in the other part of the country for India. So it's only Canada and Russia the two countries for which the overall effect of climate change, when assessed accounting for all the components, may be positive. 
Africa and Asia will be the continent that will bear the greatest uh, economic losses, that will bear the greatest economic losses. And more or less, health and agricultural impacts account for more than 80% of the total impacts. And tourism, energy, and extreme events and impact on coastal areas account for the remaining 20%. So these are average values. And they are based on a complex model that uh, introduce climate assumptions, agricultural assumptions, economic models, and there are a lot of uncertainties. So don't take them uh, exactly as an accurate figure, it's just a broad order of magnitude. So what are the a few estimations? It's, it's very general. This morning, Augustin Colette gave, uh, for each scenario, very precise estimation of the cost in terms of billions uh, of dollars and so on. It's just he expressed in terms of gross national product to have an order of magnitude of the impact. So an increase in temperature of 2 degrees Celsius uh, would result from 2050 in most studies by an impact estimated between 1 and 3 percent of the gross national product per year, and up to 5 to 6 percent, depending on the assumptions. Uh, if the temperature increases by 4 degrees uh, by the end of the century, it could be up to 10% of the gross national product. And this uncertainty, 1, 2, 3, up to 5, are due to the, the effects that are assessed. We have seen in section 1 that there are uh, many effects. The valuation method used, we have seen in section 2, that we can take into account only market, non-market, and various use, non-use components of, of, of the uh, of the value of uh, good. The choice of the discount rate, we are going to, to see it in the next section, and whether or not extreme events are taken into account. So here, for instance, we can see, uh, following the ADDs uh, model, uh, the impact on the GNP. GNP, you have GNP on the y-axis here. Here you have time, and you see for Different scenario, let's start with this central scenario here, the blue one. You have the uncertainty here expressed, depending on the assumption, and an additional uncertainty with other assumptions. And you see that at the beginning of the period, there are small, very teeny differences in the valuation of, of the impact on GNP of the climate change. But as long as time passes, the uncertainty increases, and at the end of the uh, century, you can see that the uncertainty is very large. And here, it is the central tendency if we take into account extreme events, the grey dots, and you have, even if it is not represented on the, on the figure, even larger uncertainty here around this central tendency. So you can see that even if it is more or less, all economists agree that it is about 1% uh, uh, the, the, the impact uh, in 2050, in 2100, depending on the attention, you, you can see that the uh, certainty is, is, is going to be very large. Now, regarding the costs of the policies, there are mitigation policies that are looking for uh, reducing the emissions and then reducing the speed of, of, of the climate change. Uh, they are discussed in the uh, COP21, for instance, every COP or uh, every country try to, to, to say what is going to, they are going to implement to, to reduce the speed of climate change. And there are also uh, adaptation policies. First, let us start with the mitigation policies. Uh, it has been estimated that policies that would allow a 25% reduction in equivalent CO2 emissions compared to 2015 have an estimated annual impact between 1 and 3% of the global uh, GNP. Here again, there are large disparities between countries. Uh, due to the mix uh, of energy, the sources of emission, and the, the way of life. And with the most favorable assumption, it has been criticized by uh, other economists. In uh, the report uh, directed by uh, Stern, Sir Stern, um, this uh, cost m might be negative. That is, there might be benefits because it, it takes one of the assumptions, one of the uh, scenario. Uh, took into account in the Stern report uh, the co-benefits associated to uh, the policy of the mitigation policies. And uh, the most favorable assumptions lead to uh, positive effects of the policies themselves. Usually a policy has a cost, and here in some tiny cases, 
it may have a benefit. So it's a win-win strategy. The cost of the policy you implement are benefits, and these policies will have a benefit. So you have double benefits. But it has been criticized due to the choices, in particular the choice of the discount rate. And then you have the assessment of adaptation policies. Because we know that we will not be able to, to even keep the increase below two degrees. So there will be uh, consequences of climate change. So it's a good thing to think now how to adapt the society to the consequences of climate change. And these policies are less costly. They are between 0 0.2 and 1% of uh, the global GNP. And uh, we will see that economists are more confident in the effectiveness of adaptation policies than of mitigation policies. So they are more prone to uh, implement policies that uh, would uh, adapt the society to climate change than to implement policies that will mitigate uh, climate change. So one of the crucial components of this uh, valuation are discounting. Uh, discounting, as I said, is a way to uh, compare intertemporally uh, financial flows, and the choice of the rate is crucial. Uh, I will have figures that uh, will make this very obvious uh, for you. And there, there are the, we observed a crucial change in the choice of this uh, discount rate because until, the, until 2000, most of the reports use a very high discount rate. And by doing this, if you discount the future very highly, it means that the future has almost no value, uh, not by choice, but by the choice of the discount rate. You assess the flow of future benefits with a high discount rate, it means that uh, the future benefits have a low value today. When you have to decide now what would be the, uh, you, how much you are willing to pay to implement these policies, because the flow of benefits in the future is reduced, you will not uh, be prone to implement ambitious policy. And they were discouraged because the view was a short view at short term, because the future has no, no weight. Then uh, Stern, in particular, proposed a very low, uh, for, for opponents, discount rate of 1.4%, that this uh, discount rate gives a high significant uh, weight to the future, and then it advocates immediate and important measures to limit climate change. Then to compare the, the costs and benefits of mitigation policies, as I said, economists are divided on the scale and the implementation agenda of greenhouse gas re emission reduction policies, and uh, even if most advocate for prompt and important action, uh, they agree that costs remain lower than the consequences, more or less, but the, the, the order of magnitude is, is not very large. Uh, if you compare, it's about 2 or 3% in each case, so uh, if you add the uncertainty to these figures, uh, the cost-benefit analysis of the mitigation policies are not uh, shared uh, by the community of economists. But for the, when you compare the costs and benefits of adaptation policy, the, here the conclusions are more concordant because the costs are about three to four times lower than those of the mitigation policies. And because the benefits are half, then uh, you have costs that are four times lower and benefits are, that are twice uh, lower. It, the balance is in favor of these adaptation policies. I don't know, I will skip that. You will look by yourself. Why? Thank you. Just this, this figure is interesting because it, it is uh, close to something that Augustin Collet this morning uh, showed. Uh, in order to limit the increase of temperature, we have to reduce the emission of uh, CO2 equivalent each year. Some studies have said that we need a reduction of 38 gigaton of CO2 to be able to reach. If we start in 2010, we need to uh, remove uh, 338 uh, gigaton of CO2 emission from now to uh, 2030. The way we can uh, remove this uh, emission can be ranked it correspond to policies, and these policies can be ranked depending on what is the cost of the policies, that is, what is the cost of each 
ton of CO2 equivalent removed. There are different policies on lighting of microelectronics, car, uh, hybrid cars, uh, plug-in hybrid, uh, change in agriculture, uh, organic soil restoration, and so on and so on. And you can rank all these uh, policies and compute what is, the, depending on the cost of the policy, depending on how much it's going to remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, what is the cost of an abatement of one, one ton of, of uh, CO2. And you can see here that all these policies below zero, the cost is negative. That means that, for instance, if you replace lighting and you switch from incandescent to LED, in addition to the fact that you have less electricity to be used because, uh, and then uh, you remove, when electricity is produced by coal, for instance, you remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, you have additional uh, benefits uh, the paid price because they are lower consumption, so that all the benefits up to here, all this one ranked here, are the ton of carbon removed is a benefit and not a cost. And then if you rank them up to here, you see that to reach the 38 gigaton CO2 equivalent per year, the last policy to be implemented to reach this would be a change in gas plant and the cost of one ton of uh, CO2 equivalent removed would be around 80 euros, which, which is, uh, which is uh, r relatively low because, uh, for instance, in, uh, the, the price of a carbon ton in Sweden is currently about 100 euros, for instance. So there exist policies that are implemented and for which the cost of one ton of CO2 removed are higher than 100 euros. So you can see that if we decide to implement all these policies, starting by the most effect effective to this one, we can succeed in removing this 38 gigaton CO2 starting now uh, and before 230, and the cost will not be so, so huge. So in conclusion, uh, since the measures to limit climate change will probably be insufficient, we need adaptation and limitation uh, to reduce the uh, damages due to climate change. And this may offer some economic opportunities. The co-benefits have been presented uh, a minute ago. And this will also reduce the scientific uncertainty because if, if we reduce the speed of the climate change, we reduce the uncertainty. But we must act very quickly because time is uh, going on uh, <laughs> in every sense. And then... Uh, we, we have to, to take the decision very, very quickly. And finally, uh, we must pay attention to the ethical issues when you consider the global uh, issue of climate change. Yesterday, we were in the local air pollutant framework and uh, we were uh, reasoning within the country. But here, when we, we, are, we have a global approach, uh, we have to pay attention to the fact that um, if we use country-specific values for the value of prevented fatality due to climate change, then we have ethical issues when, uh, depending on where the deaths are avoided. So we have to, uh, to be aware of that. Then, regarding the influence of time, I will focus on discounting. So for economists, discounting are, are composed by four components here the pure preference of the present, the gross rate of the economy, the relative aversion of intemporal inequality, and the precautionary effect. You have the definition, you will look by yourself uh, on the PDF. All these components are positive, negative, can be positive, negative, or, uh, or null. And they are summed up, summed up. So that, more or less, uh, they rely on uh, beliefs, they rely on subjective values, so that the, the range of the discount rate, discount rate that can be used is between 0 0.5 and 10%. If someone chooses 0 0.5, it's not going to be absolutely stupid. If it's about 10, it's the same thing. It's the extreme values, but they are plausible values we, we can find in the literature. But the more distant the temporal horizon is, the heaviest are the consequences of discounting on the variation of future monetary flows. And I will show you this with the two values uh, of the discount rates used by Stern, 1.5% per, per year and up to the 
uh, year 2000, around 10% to show you uh, how much the issue import is important. Here you have euros on the y-axis and years, one century, on the x-axis. 100 today, if you do not discount, is worth 100 in each of the 100 following years. 100 euros today is worth only uh, 25 euros if you use the discount rate proposed by uh, Stern, that is 1.5% per year, and 100 euros today is only a few cents if you use the discount rate of 10% per year. So you can see, for instance, that uh, it is equal after 50 years to 100 when you do not discount to uh, 50 euros if you discount at the rate of 1.4 and to 85 cents if you discount at 10%. Then imagine a flow of benefits that are 100 euro per year during one century. If you do that without discounting, it is 100 times 100 is uh, 10,000. So one, a flow of 100 euros not discounted after one century, you get 10,000 euros. If you discount at the rate of 1.4 uh, 1 per year, you get less than 6,000 euros. And if you discount by uh, using the rate of 10%, you get about 1,000 euros. You see that the effect of discounting, the choice of the discount rate, is one of the major uh, assumption to be done and make the uh, valuation differ uh, even if with the same assumption for the other uh, choices done. So which rate should we use? Here again, there are no market for discount rate. There are, mar uh, there are market for interest rate, but not for discount rate because it includes other components than the growth of the, of the economy. So there have been, uh, a few years ago, a survey, which is called a Delphi survey, which means that you ask uh, people that should have a little knowledge on this topic, that is economist. Uh, Weizmann in 1998 asked uh, 1,700 uh, 1, economists what they guess, they imagine should be the, the proper discount rate to be used for projects with distant effects more than 30 years. And you have the distribution here of the answers of this economist. And more or less, the, the value that, the median value is about 2% 2, 2, uh, 2 per year. So uh, if you have to choose a disc discount rate, the choice of around 2% per year would be uh, uh, pr the proper choice. The second way time, uh, time enters the analysis is through a certainty because there are several uncertainties. As economists, we uh, collect the uncertainties from the other disciplines, uh, agriculture, epidemiology, uh, and uh, specialists of marine resources, and we add our own uh, uncertainties. So we have to account for all this bundle of uncertainties. Some are scientific related, uh, some are human related, and the evolution of the population, of the habits of the population, the economic condition, the technology, that would exist in 50 years to reduce the CO2 emission on the consequences of climate change. Some are methodological. We improve the models. We introduce uh, different components of value. We use different uh, values for VPF. And overall, they accumulate. For air pollution, we have less uh, uncertainty because, as I said, it's short, shorter term effects and we already know most of the effects that exist on morbidity and mortality, and the impact on crops are, are known, and buildings are also known. For climate change, as you know, there are much more uncertainties at each step of the uh, analysis. So that the confidence intervals around the values given by IPCC, for instance, show how important are the uncertainties in here you have time, here you have the annual GHG uh, emission, emission, and you see that the envelope of the low, of the, all the scenarios here, you see that uh, in 2100, you may have a decrease between 
minus something and plus uh, 200 uh, uh, gigaton of CO2 uh, equivalent per year. So depending on the scenario, even within the, this one, this one, this one, and this one, you have an uncertainty here that is mentioned with the bar, the colored bar here, and the, the wool envelope is, uh, uh, entails a huge uh, uncertainty. Um, I, w I will focus now on the concept of irreversibility, which is linked to, to time. Because for uh, greenhouse gas, we have huge uh, irreversibilities in terms of emission and the ecological irreversibilities due to the fact that CO2 disappears uh, in a few uh, centuries uh, from the atmosphere. In fact, that even if we reduce today uh, our emission, that that will need, we will need time to stabilize the CO2 uh, concentration, several centuries to stabilize temperature increase, and a few millennia to stabilize sea level because of the inertia of, the, of each of the systems. And there are almost no ecological irreversibilities for local pollutants uh, because of the, there are no uh, stock uh, buildup uh, or the, the meteorological condition make uh, things move very, very quickly, even if nothing else changes. We have large economic irreversibilities for the greenhouse gas and local pollutants because we have to implement policies that are ambitious and are going to change the practice and the habits of people. And this will require uh, time and uh, involve uh, sunk cost. So all this put together, that is huge uncertainties and irreversibilities, imply that the concept of flexibility of a policy when you are looking for an optimal decision is crucial. Because you have a rival of information. The, the arrival of information from the scientific perspective is important because there are scientific publications every day. The IPCC produces uh, regularly report on the effects of climate change. Uh, we do not uh, know uh, what would be the effectiveness of the implementation of a policy, but after a few years, we can uh, see by ourselves whether or not the policy was effective. We do not know uh, what would be the next uh, conclusion of the COP, uh, for instance, uh, what would be the announcement of the various countries uh, uh, related to the uh, uh, policies implemented to reduce uh, emission. And at the same time, the, the irreversibility of the phenomena will not allow rapid policy change. If you decide to change all the nuclear power plants in France by other way of production, it will require decades to, to, to obtain that. It's not going to be very uh, rapid. So all these say that uh, when you decide to choose to implement a policy at a given date for a given objective, you must have in mind that it should be flexible enough to adapt to a new arrival of information. You then have to embed a new decision process, what I've called uh, earlier the informational value, that is the component of the total economic value that is devoted to the fact that you are waiting for arrival of, of information and this has a value. And a simple, uh, well, I sum up before showing you the graph, the figure. The choice you have as a public uh, decision maker would be uh, that you face a double-edged constraint. That is, you should avoid acting too rapidly and too strongly, which could have significant short-term effects on the economy and the population. But by at the same time, you should avoid acting too late and not be able to meet reasonable targets to limit climate change because of these irreversibility uh, effects. So you have to to here, for instance, the figure, I think it, it's more clear. Imagine that you decide here which policy to implement. You do nothing. It is the reference in green here. These are the emission in gigaton of equivalent CO2. If you decide here that the target is 550 particles per, per, per million in the, in the atmosphere of CO2, you choose 
the pink trajectory here. And you get here, you have all these emissions. If you say, I'm going to decide which would be the target in 2020 only, you start by being less, more ambitious regarding the reduction of emission here to be able to reach each of the three targets in 2020 when you have to decide here. And in 2020, if the arrival of information say, okay, in fact, we should really limit the emission in order to uh, 550 ppm at this horizon. Oh, it's wrong time reversal. I, I took this picture from this, this source. And I, I think that's, that's a mistake in the date here. So then you can relax a little bit the constraint to stay on this red line. If at this time you see, in fact, there are a lot of extreme events we, that were not planned here, and we learned that it's worse than what we thought, then we can change the trajectory to, to try to limit the CO2 concentration to 450. And in the opposite, if we find that the arrival of information are in fact positive and the problem is less acute than we thought, you can relax a little bit here to reach the 650 ppm uh, target. So in conclusion, uh, we have to take into account time the economic approach of the effects of climate change because uh, the horizon is very distant, and uh, this leads to more complex analysis because we have to choose a discount rate, and the choice of a discount rate is crucial, and there are more uncertainty about its economic valuation. And in addition, it has a subjective uh, choice to be done because there are no market for discount rate, as I said. Okay. Then I'm going to move to uh, an application on climate change in Camargue. I have a content, it's okay. So what, what is Camargue? I will show maps, but... Ah, yes. Is it the of the uh, I, I will show maps. It's the south of France, yes. Delta is south of France. So it's a regional park, in addition, about 100 kilometers, square kilometer, located in the Rhone Delta. 70% is less than one meter above sea level, and 25% of this area is below sea level. It suffered major storm, the three last uh, in 1982, 1997, 2003, and ma some major floods uh, in 1840, uh, you have the date, and it has lost 330 hectares since 1945, gained by the sea. According to the NASA, which uh, control uh, and maps uh, every year on continuously uh, the surface of the earth. It is a place in the world where uh, the sea uh, gain uh, the more rapidly. It's about uh, four meters per year during the 50 last years. So it is uh, a place interesting to, to see what would be the effect in other places in the world with the less uh, rapid uh, evolution. We will see why it is particularly prone to climate change. It has been classified biosphere reserve by UNESCO. It is a place where we have wetland area, dry land, freshwater, Mediterranean Sea, agriculture, industry, tourism, fauna, and flora that are, are melt in this, in this place. As you see, we are here. This is France. Here, it's Camargue. Map of France with a zoom here. Camargue is here between Montpellier and Marseille. And this is in the Rhone Delta, here. Here you have uh, big lakes. Uh, the sea, Mediterranean Sea is here. Here you have industries. And here you have salt industries, salt march. If you have tourism uh, almost everywhere, and agriculture in this part, and rice also here. This is a national uh, park. This is some pictures for the nature for the wildlife with the uh, white horses and the uh, flamingo, pink flamingo here. You have uh, cattle with uh, bulls. You have uh, rice culture, and you have uh, industries with salt uh, extracted from the, the Mediterranean Sea. 
and tourism here. Okay. Now, why is Camargue particularly exposed to climate change? There are two reasons. The th three of them, uh, there are <laughs> five reasons. Three of them are due to climate change, and the two uh, last ones are due to the special uh, configuration of, of Camargue. First, the sea level rise. As I said, it's causing a sea advance of about four meters per year for 50 years, which leads to an increase in sea salt in the, in the ground, which hinders agriculture and degrades uh, flora, a degradation of the dam at sea protecting the coastline. We can see here there is a big dam here, from here to here. There is a dam that protects all this area from flood entering from the Mediterranean Sea, but sometimes when there is a storm and uh, low pressure, low atmospheric pressure and, and uh, high waves, then it enters and it, it, it takes a uh, month to go back to the, the sea. The salt water going inside the Camargue uh, in case of flood coming from the the, the sea uh, requires a month to be uh, completely removed. So second reason, there is an increase of rains and storm intensity with this going to fill the ponds or the lakes within the Camargue, which are difficult to empty when the sea level is too high and cause floods of the Rhone, which increase the risk of breakage of dikes. If there are too much water, too much rain, then in addition to filling the, the lakes in the Camargue, it's going to increase the debit of the Rhône, which is a major uh, river in, in France. And, and then there can be flood coming from the Rhône in addition to uh, coming from the sea. And there is also, this is a paradox, but higher rains and also an average loss in the flow of the Rhône due to drought episode, which leads to a rise of salt in the soil the technical term is salt wedge, and more, uh, more and more inland, and a loss of fresh water resources coming from the Rhône. So the Rhône did not bring enough fresh water to Camargue to fight against the salt coming from the sea. Then there are two additional reasons that aggra aggravate the, the, the effect of climate change. The first is the, the a decrease in the alluvium carried by the Rhône, a division by four in the century, so there are less mud, less little stones, less uh, alluvium bringing by the Rhône in the Camargue, and this is due to the domestication of the, the Rhône and changes in the agricultural practice in the Rhône and Durance. And in addition, there have been dikes uh, along the, the Rhône that uh, do not uh, allow the river to deposit the remaining alluvium. They have been divided by four, and in addition, because of the dikes along the Rhône, they cannot enter the Camargue and, and bring some materials, uh, some alluvium, in the Camargue. And finally, uh, the Rhône Delta is constituted, constituted by, of alluvial deposits, and it sinks, independently uh, uh, from other reasons, it sinks by one millimeter per year. If you have the sea level that rise and the ground that sinks, uh, in a, this combined to make Camargue one of the places in the world with is the most exposed to climate change consequences. Then, what are the, the impacts of climate change? We will see that there are three main impacts, economic, social, and ecologic. <coughs> they can be ranked depending on the, their vulnerability to climate change. In red, you have the strong vulnerability to climate change. In yellow, in light yellow, you have the weak vulnerability or uncertain, and they can also be ranked depending on their market components, nature, their non-market nature, or, or their uh, mixed nature. So, as the, based on what I've said up to now, based on the picture I've shown and what I've said before, what, according to you, are the impacts of climate change in Camargue? Five minutes. One o'clock, but it was. Two, but I can pass. Two minutes. Two. 
You can skip the question. But one. OK, but do I, I will present the impacts, and I will ask only the second question. So these are the impacts. They are economic on agriculture, tourism, and industry. They are social impacts on earth, buildings, and infrastructures. And they are ecological impacts on water resources and environments. You can detail all the components here. These components are have different vulnerabilities to climate change. The most vulnerable are the rice culture, the beach and building destruction due to coastal erosion, the marine submersion, and here impact on water resources, all the water resources, and the salinization and erosion of the littoral zone and of uh, fresh water wetland cycle are the most vulnerable to climate change. Then, second question, Within these uh, impacts, which of them are market and which of them are non-market impacts? So I, I put them on the screen. What would be the, the components that could be the impacts that could be assessed through uh, a market? So where do we have price? Uh, more or less here. More or less here. Okay, for agriculture, we have prices for all of that here. The buildings and the infrastructure can be evaluated by markets. Okay. Building, okay. Uh, water resources can be also, as we said previously, what you have to pay to, I oh, know this is another point, no, so no, this, that uh, no. This, and, okay. Yeah, and this. Oh, yes, uh, I, I you really have a question why the industry is affected, because if you increase the salinity, you should increase the production of salt. So for me, it could be a positive if, effect. Yes, but to, to gain the salt, you have to remove the water. If you cannot remove the water at the time, water should be removed because it has been flooded. Okay, by flood. Okay, okay. No, no, it's clear. Um, and then Just a uh, purpose of timing. Okay, okay. And you can also, the social, the health impacts, you can also have the cost of illness, so you can also quantify some of them in terms of... Of them, that's yeah. it. More or less, you're right. Here are the market components, except the worsening of thermal comfort, which is more <laughs> non-market. For the buildings, damages to buildings also. Which are non-market, all the ecological impacts, and the two components that uh, are related to thermal comfort. There are no market for thermal comfort, and these are mixed. The health effects, because we have seen yesterday that there are both market and non-market components. Uh, excuse just, me. Just I have questions. Uh, in which year the dam is built? Was built the dam? Yes. In in which year? Oh, uh, just after. It started uh, after the major flood in, at the end of the 19th century. And since that, it has been improved, uh, changed, rebuilt, uh, but it started uh, 150 years ago. I think this is the main problem. When they built the dam, they effect on climate change. They change the nature of this area. I, I are, think th this is the essential problem. This is one problem. of the issues, but without dam, there are two types of dam. Along, uh, a dam, dam, oh, oh, you, say you mean dam on the run? Yeah. Yeah, dam on the run, it's, uh, there, there are digs between the sea and the Camargue, digs along the run, and there are dam uh, uh, up, upside the run, and it was during the mid of the 20th century, the largest dam on the Rhone that provide uh, hydroelectricity and that uh, avoid uh, flood due to the Rhone or the Durance, uh, have been built in the middle of the 20th century. But the dicks that protect Camargue from the sea or, or from flood from the Rhone was at the end of the 19th century. Okay, Dikes. thanks. Uh, I, I, I would like to continue his argument 
how to distinguish the impact of dam and climate change on changing the wetland scenario of that part? No, the dam are another uh, impact that add to those of climate change, in this case for Camargue. The fact that the dam does not uh, allow alluvium to enter the Camargue and to replace uh, what the sea gains on the on the ground, the, earth, uh, not the, the ground. Uh, you see that it's an additional effect. The three main effects of climate change: what uh, sea level rise, uh, the two uh, uh, lowering in the debit of the run, and also flash flood, kind of flash flood, and then in addition there are the. the Camargue is sinking, and uh, there are less alluvium coming due to the dam. So I think uh, I will quickly show what have been the damages of the last flood, major, fl major flood in 2003. For agriculture, it has been assessed to be about 80 million euros. For industry, about 367 million euros and damages to building and infrastructure were about uh, overall uh, 400 million euros with a total of, one, uh, of uh, 847 million euros for the last flood. And then uh, we can see all the areas that were flood in 2003, all the colored areas were flood. Depending on the nature of the area, there are different colors, but all these areas were, were flood. And requires a month uh, before uh, being uh, as uh, before the flood. I think I will skip the two scenarios and you have it on the, oops, just stop here. No, stop here. Here we can assess what would be the adaptation measures to limit the consequences of climate, climate change by uh, developing dikes along the Rhone, uh, and the cost would be uh, around 300 uh, uh, million. And to secure all the digs along the Camargue, that is 210 and 10 kilometers of dikes, uh, it is estimated at about 800 million, and then how a small benefit, a little benefit cost analysis would work would be to compute the benefits, that is what would be the damages avoided if we construct these dikes. So for a type of flood and for a given period, for instance, one century, we compute the benefits avoided in the event of uh, backfill failure, bridge in upper or overflow in the run despite development at different places. That to sum up what would be the benefits if we avoid a flood. We take into account the probability of occurrence of each of these events, a flood of uh, a period of uh, observation one century, a millennial flood, and so on, and how would resist the dikes against this type of flood. So we compute the probability of occurrence of each of these events, flood, not flood, for each of these floods. We do this calculation for different types of, of flood with corresponding probability of occurrence. That would be the benefits, that is the damages avoided. Then we compute what would be the mitigation cost by evaluating all the work of securing dikes and concerted management of the river over the same period. And then we choose a discount rate to express this flow of benefit and cost streams in net present value because you will observe the mitigation cost today. You implement policies to secure uh, the dikes and to manage properly the dike, but the benefits up to the next flood, you will have no benefit. It, it is in the event of the next major flood that would be avoided that you would observe benefits by not having damages. So in conclusion, uh, and this is the last slide, Camargue is an area extremely exposed to climate change, which translates into increased risk of flooding by flood or runoff and aggravated by rising sea level. The economic assessments of the effects of climate change involve a large number of sectors, as we have seen. And in addition, there are non-market impacts associated with the degradation of ecosystem and water resources that have not been accounted for in this analysis. 
as well as non-market health-related effects like psychological effects of flood, fear, uh, health effects of this type did not enter the analysis here. Finally, the, the evaluation of the cost of damages associated with floods makes it possible to establish the order of magnitude of the benefits to be expected from decrease in the probabilities of flooding, whether it is through the implementation of global policies to limit climate change, uh, limiting the CO2 emission to limit the, the increase in temperature, or to local policies to attenuate the effect of climate change, the consequences of climate change by uh, implementing uh, and improving the, the, the dikes uh, and the, the management of the dikes. This is policy, these are policies that uh, attenuate the effect of climate change and the global policies that limit emissions are another type of, of emission and both concur to, uh, to reduce the consequences of uh, climate change in every place and here in Cameroon. Okay, thank you. So, we missed, oh yeah, okay, coming. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, due to the degradation uh, of wetland, because of the climate change, uh, is there any impact on water quality into the poor water quality, like in Camorg uh, effects on the Rhone River, which is which one of the best, uh, we can say, uh, not best, the <laughs> largest river in the South France. So just I would like to know what is the water quality effects because of the degradation of the wetlands, because of the climate change. Could you a little bit explain about this? Whether water quality is yes. the water quality is uh, affected by uh, climate change through uh, the wetland. Yeah, mark. It, it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, by uh, one of your colleagues the, the fact that uh, there are self purifying properties of uh, wetland areas so that the quality of the water that uh, get out of, from these uh, wetland areas are uh, better. Uh, so this uh, has been observed, and this is one of the components which is accounted for in this type of analysis. Just I would like to know this especially for the Rhone River, Rhone River, or South France. I know, everywhere. But I couldn't see any points in your conclusion about the water quality degradation due to the, this effects, climate change. That's why I asked. Okay, thank you. I got it. Um, um, uh, you have shown that uh, many approaches to estimate the, the climate change costs. However, the, the input data that you have uh, uh, used for constructing your approach are mainly depthly because it's statistical uh, data. So uh, there, there are any uh, techniques or approach to improve your input data to, uh, to reduce the uncertainty that you have uh, found in your uh, estimation. Thank you. Uh, which one? Uh, uh, you showed some uh, picture. Was the uncertainty related to estimation is uh, huge? Yes, okay. But the point is that uh, there are many sources of uncertainties. Uh, so that it depends on the assumption uh, and the type of model and the type of simulation that are uh, implemented. So under a given set of assumptions, we can reduce uncertainties because we have common assumption. But as soon as we take into account several, uh, the, the whole range of possibilities, by definition, the uncertainty is going to increase. So it's, it's, all, it's still B, it still is a statistical approach because you, you, you simulate models a million and million times and then you get a various uh, range of results and then you choose a 95% confidence interval, for instance, to express uncertainty or you say very likely and not likely. But I agree with you on the fact that it is uh, statistical uncertainty finally that you get B. 
because you have a distribution of values and you have properties of this distribution. But at the origin, it is due to the assumptions that have been done. So to re reduce the, the uncertainty by reducing the set of assumptions, you have the risk to, to miss what is, in fact, the, 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 the set of assumptions that is the most close to what could be in the future. So there's a trade-off on uh, uh, reducing uncertainty and uh, being false uh, and being uh, wrong in, in the conclusion. And we will only know whether or not we are wrong in uh, 50 years or one century. So if we do not account for that when taking the decision today, it's, uh, it's a risk. Thank you for your lectures. Uh, just I, I would like to know, are there any solution for Camaro until now? Are there any, someone put some solution for this problem? Uh, to be honest, uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, even what is done, uh, it's just a matter of acceptability, social acceptability, because the main city, uh, well, I cannot come back. The main city is Sainte Marie de la Mer, which is close to the sea. And it has been protected by dikes more and more, and specific dikes in the sea and around the city to protect the city, which is a huge place where, uh, of uh, religious place. Uh, every year there is a big, uh, so for, uh, okay, a big religious place in addition to having tourism and people living there. And the fact you protect this city uh, worsen the effect of climate change and the rise of sea level around the cities. So in, in a few uh, decades, we will have, like Mont Saint-Michel in France, the city of Sainte Marie de la Mer here, and then uh, water all around were not protected. And uh, some of, of courageous politicians say we should start to think of uh, letting the, the sea uh, suppress the city. But there is also a very old church and so on. So it's difficult to accept for the population, for politicians. But uh, scientists say uh, uh, this city is lost in two or three centuries. Thank you. So maybe we could have lunch now. Let's stop. Thank you very much, Olivier.